Training Module 2.3 Determination of Reference Evapotranspiration The learning objective of this presentation is to become familiar with the determination of ET0. ET0 can be computed from weather data with the fao penman montit equation. Therefore, it requires information about the energy sources, like radiation, air temperature. They will quantify the vaporization of liquid water. Additionally, we need information about air humidity and wind speed, because they quantify the vapor removal. Evapotranspiration consists of vaporization of liquid water and vapor removal, and this is described in the Fao Penman Montit equation. Vaporization of liquid water, mainly with the energy term, and the vapor removal with the help of the aerodynamic term. So the required data to compute ET0 is air temperature, humidity data, radiation data, and wind speed. And on top of it, we also require station characteristics. Let's start with air temperature. Air temperature is measured in a Stephenson shelter with the help of a min-max thermometer which measured the air temperature at the standard height of 2 meters. Air humidity. Now, air humidity is expressed as a vapor pressure deficit. It is a difference between the saturation and the actual vapor pressure. Most likely you are very familiar with atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the mass of the atmosphere on the surface of the Earth, about 100 kilopascal. Now, vapor pressure is something similar, but now we are going to consider only the mass of the water molecules. As such, it is a very good indicator of air humidity, because if you remove or add one water molecule, the mass will change and as such the vapor pressure changes as well. In the books of physics, you will find the equation giving the saturation vapor pressure for various temperature. At 17 degrees and a half, vapor pressure is about 2. At 29, it is already 4 kilopascal. So with this equation, I can calculate the saturated vapor pressure by considering the saturated vapor pressure at the maximum and the minimum temperature. The actual vapor pressure is very difficult to determine as such. We need instruments with which we can determine it indirectly. One of such an instrument is the dew point thermometer. What you see here is a rather old device. These days, these are electronic uh, thermocouples actually are used to measure dew point, but it consists of the same principle. We are in a room where the air temperature is 37 degrees and we have a certain actual vapor pressure, which is unknown. Now with the dew point thermometer, I can measure that. The dew point thermometer consists of a steel chamber in which I have a sample of the air of the surrounding room. The next step consists now in cooling the air inside that chamber by spraying alcohol on the steel chamber. Alcohol vaporizes very quickly since the ring is of steel, the steel ring will provide the energy and consequently the air inside the chamber is cooling very quickly. I don't add or subtract water molecules from the chamber. I'm just cooling the air. At a certain moment, 
I read the point of saturation. The air is now fully saturated. At that moment, I will have dew formation on the mirror, which is at the back of the chamber. And I read the temperature on the thermometer, which is fixed on the dew point meter. In my example, it is 23.5. I look in my books of physics and I find that at 23.5, I have a saturation vapor pressure of 3 kilopascal. Consequently, the actual vapor pressure, which was unknown, is also 3 kilopascal. So it is a very good device to measure vapor pressure. Other instruments allow me also to determine the actual vapor pressure, such as the hygrometer or a psychrometer, which consists of a dry bulb and a wet bulb thermometer. So I measure those temperatures and the difference, the depression, actually is a measure for the actual vapor pressure. FAO has developed also guidelines what we have to do if there is missing air humidity data. In that case, we are going to assume that the dew point temperature is more or less the same as the minimum temperature. During the night, temperature is dropping and just before sunrise you reach the minimum temperature and you will notice that most of the time everything gets very humid. That is because the air becomes saturated and actually you have reached the dew point temperature. By using the minimum temperature as an estimate of the dew point temperature, I can calculate the actual vapor pressure. Here we see a picture which was taken early in the morning in summer on a day on which there was no rain. No rain because the pavements are dry and it is early in the morning I can see that the shadows are very long. Nevertheless, the car which is parked in the street is wet. That is because during the night the temperature dropped and just before sunrise, I reached the minimum temperature, which corresponds with the dew point temperature, so everything gets wet. Then the sun comes up, the temperature starts rising, but my car, which is in the shadow, which is of steel, is still a little bit cooler, and as such, it is my dew point thermometer on which I can see the dew formation. This illustrates indeed that minimum temperature is a good estimate of the dew point temperature. Let me show you another example. Here we are in India, in Hyderabad. We're in that station of Ikrisat. For each day, maximum and minimum temperature and relative humidity is measured. If I use the temperature and the relative humidity data, I can calculate that the vapor pressure deficit is 1.24 kilopascal. If I use only the temperature, so assume that I have no knowledge about the actual vapor pressure given by the relative humidity. So if I use only the temperature, I can calculate the saturated vapor pressure and by using the minimum temperature as an estimate of the dew point temperature, I can calculate the actual vapor pressure. The result is 1.19 kilopascal. And you see that there is only a difference of 4% between the measured value and the estimated value. Net radiation. The sun emits radiation, which is shortwave radiation, because it is at high temperature. That radiation, that energy, will eat up the Earth, and as a consequence also the Earth starts to emit radiation. This is long-wave radiation, because the temperature of the Earth is much more lower than this of the sun. Now, the net radiation is the difference between the net incoming shortwave radiation and the net outgoing long-wave radiation. Radiation can be measured with different devices. 
We have a solarimeter to measure the incoming shortwave radiation. We have sunshine recorders to measure the hours of bright sunshine. And then with the help of the Angstrom formula, I can calculate solar radiation. There exists also a net radiometer with which I can measure net radiation directly. In the case of missing radiation data, I have no idea what is the solar radiation arriving at the Earth. Therefore, we can use a method to estimate that, and that is the air temperature difference method. It considers the difference between the maximum and the minimum air temperature. In the case we have a clear sky, a lot of radiation will reach the Earth, about 75% of the extraterrestrial radiation. A lot of energy is arriving, consequently the air will eat up and the maximum air temperature will be relatively high on such a day with a clear sky. However, during the night, due to the absence of clothes, the energy can escape very easily and the minimum air temperature will be relatively low. Or the difference between min and max will be large. Contrary, if we have a fully cloudy sky, only about 25% of the extraterrestrial radiation can reach the Earth. Maximum air temperature will be relatively low, and during the night, the heat can hardly escape because the clothes act as a blanket, and so the minimum temperature will be relatively high, or the difference between min and max will be low. So with the air temperature difference method, I get a very good idea of the solar radiation. Now, of course, the amount of solar radiation depends not only on cloudiness, but also on the extraterrestrial radiation. Extraterrestrial radiation changes with the latitude and the time of the year. At the equator, it is different than at higher latitudes, and in summer, it will be different than in winter. Here you see the extraterrestrial radiation at the equator. It is about 35 megajoule per square meter per day throughout the year. Although it is not exactly the same, that's because the sun is not always right above the equator. If we move north, we are in Hyderabad. Further north, Algiers. Further north, Brussels. In Brussels, we can see that the extraterrestrial radiation during the winter, January, February, November, December, is very small. That is because the day length is very short. During the summer, the extraterrestrial radiation is larger than at the equator, not because we receive more energy per unit of time, it is actually smaller, but we have longer days than the 12 hours days at the equator. So in total, we get more extraterrestrial radiation. It's not the radiation at the Earth's surface, it is the extraterrestrial radiation. So, to conclude, we have here the equation with which we can calculate or estimate the solar radiation. It is the square root of the difference between the maximum and the minimum temperature times the extraterrestrial radiation. There is a proportional factor, KRS, which varies between 0.16 and 0.19. At the coastal areas, it will be more something like 0.19, in interior location, more as 0.16. Once again, an example for Hyderabad. We are in November. I know what is the extraterrestrial radiation and the capital N is here the maximum hours of bright sunshine you can have. Actually, it is the day length, 11.16 hours in November. With the sunshine recorder, I know that the actual hours of bright sunshine due to cloudiness was not 11.16, but only 6.06 .06 hours per day.
I can calculate what is the solar and the net radiation and finally know that the ET node given by the Fao penma monti equation is 3.6 millimeters per day. In the case we do not have a sunshine recorder or another device to measure radiation, we can use the temperature difference method. I know that the mean daily maximum and minimum temperature for the month of November is 28.7 and 17.5 degrees respectively. I can calculate the solar and the net radiation and with the Fao penman montit equation I will calculate that ET naught is 3.7 millimeters per day. There's just a difference of 3%. Wind speed is the next climatic parameter. Wind speed is measured with an anemometer. Actually, an anemometer measures the wind run. It counts how many meters of wind have passed by. But if you express that in function of time, you get, of course, the wind speed. Wind speed varies with the height at which it is measured. If you measure the wind speed at the top of a building, as in an airport, then wind speed is much larger than the wind speed which you measure close to the Earth's surface. The Fao penman monteith method requires wind speed measured at a reference height of 2 meters. The anemometers are not always placed at 2 meters high, often they are at 10 meters high. But there exists a logarithmic function with which I can convert wind speed measured at another height to the wind speed measured at 2 meters. In the case of missing wind speed, I can select from meteorological reports for the regional climate a general class. If the wind is light, I will take about 1 meters per second if we have strong winds about 5 meters per second. If you have no report, you still can use 2 meters per second as a temperate estimate because it is the average of a lot of weather stations around the globe. Wind speed varies a lot during the day but in Fao penma Montit method, we need the average wind speed over the day. And then you get a very stable number. Wind speed, U2, appears in the nominator and the denominator of the Fao penma Montit method. So small errors of estimates of wind speed will cancel each other out. Before we can compute ET0, we also need some station characteristics. They consist of the altitude, because I have to compute a psychrometric constant, which appears in the Fao penma montit equation. I need latitude to compute the extraterrestrial radiation. And I need the location of the station. That is to determine the adjustment coefficients which I need in case I have missing meteorological data. I want to know if the station is located in an arid or humid area. This is to estimate missing air humidity data. In humid or semi-humid areas, the minimum temperature is a very good estimate of the dew point temperature. In arid and semi-arid areas, I need to subtract about 2 degrees from the minimum temperature to get an estimate of the dew point temperature. Where is your station located? At the coast or at the interior? It determines the coefficient, the proportional factor in the temperature radiation method. Is it 0.16 or 0.19? Finally, in case I have missing wind speed, I need to know what is the general winds in that area. Are these light winds? Then we will take one meter per second. Are these moderate to strong winds? Then I can take four meters per second.